Seven strangers find themselves in a weird and mysterious high-tech cube maze. They have to try and go from one room to another whilst avoiding the truly brutal and gruesome high-tech death traps hidden within the rooms, where one false move can lead our characters to suffer truly horrific deaths. So, why are they there? Who put them there? Are they there for someone's deranged enjoyment, or as an experiment, or is this even humans behind this? Our group of terrified survivors must try to work together in order to eventually somehow escape the cube in this generally unnerving and claustrophobic psychological horror movie which came out all the way back in 1997 and ever since has gone on to become a fan favourite cult movie. So it's time to work ourselves through the terrifying maze of the cube as we explore 10 things that you didn't know about this movie and if you already did, then I'll buy you an ice cream. So, let's check it out. Number 10. The original story was kinda crazy. So considering that Cube is one pretty messed up movie, it means it can only come from one place, Canada. Seriously, what's with Canada? They have given us some pretty messed up movies over the years, but hey, I ain't complaining. These messed up movies are still pretty awesome. Cube is the brainchild of its director and co-writer, Vincenzo Natalie who between 1990 and 1994 got to work on writing the script for what would become Cube. At the time, he was working as a storyboard assistant for a Canadian animation company, and the first script was kinda crazy, as it featured a monster who roams around the cube, as well as moss growing on the cube that our prisoners can eat, and the cube was literally set in hell. And it's said that this early version of the movie was more comical, with less tension and more laughs. At one stage, our helpless victims were all described as being accountants, and then that was changed to them being prisoners, with it being hinted that the cube may be part of a prison sentence, until it was decided to make the identity of the main characters more of a mystery. And it was Natalie's roommate who suggested having the characters having to try and survive dangerous traps, as well as removing food and water from the cube maze, as well as cutting out all scenes of the outside world, which added to the surreal urgency and mystery of the cube, and definitely gave it more tension. It's certainly an uncomfortable situation that makes you, the viewer, feel on edge when watching it. Number 9. The Twilight Zone Connection It's been pointed out that there are striking similarities between The Cube and the 1961 Twilight Zone episode, Five Characters in Search of an Exit, as it features five characters waking up to find themselves trapped in a cylinder prison, with no explanation or rhyme or reason as to why they are there. And just like Cube, all these strangers come from different backgrounds, where the characters must try to work together to get out, where they come to the conclusion that they're in hell. Although in the episode, it's also revealed that the characters are actually dolls, and the cylinder is a children's toy barrel. <laughs> wow, imagine if that was the ending they used in Cube. But it also seems that the James Bond movie, The Man with the Golden Gun, may have also been an inspiration for Cube, as it's directly mentioned within the movie itself, when the Quentin character explains that in The Man with the Golden Gun, the movie's main villain, Scaramanga, has a carnival-style funhouse, which is like a sinister, quirky maze, of which he uses to mess with the mind of his intended victims, as if suggesting that all those within the Cube are there at the pleasure of an evil genius. So, yeah, who would have thought that one of the Bond films, which is often considered one of the worst, could possibly influence one of the greatest horror cult movies of all time? For the record, I actually kind of like The Man with the Golden Gun, so... Number 8. The characters are named after prisons. So it's here we get to the characters' names. Some of them have some pretty interesting names, like Kazan and Ren. And the names given to each character was not done by random either, as they are all named after jails around the world. 
Quentin McNeil is named after the US jails, San Quentin State Prison, and the McNeil Islands Correction Center. Wren is named after a jail called Wren in France. Alderson is named after the Alderson Federal Prison Camp, which once again is in the US. Helen Holloway is named after the Holloway Women's Prison in the UK. Kazan is named after Kazan Prison in Russia. And finally, the Joan Levin and David Wirth characters are named after the Leavenworth Prison in the States. Knowing that the characters are named after prisons does give it more insights into the story, as it kind of suggests that the cube maze is some kind of prison punishment for previous crimes, which, as mentioned, was a subplot that was going to be explained in an early version of the script. Number 7. A short film got Cube off the ground. In order to get investors interested in Cube, Natalie co-wrote and directed a short movie called Elevated. The story is a basic one. It involves strangers in an elevator, with a paranoid security guard who believes that aliens are outside the elevator and killing people. Like Cube, Elevator works with paranoia, as well as the exploration of strangers being confined to a small space. So really, this 20-minute movie would have given producers an insight into how Cube would have been filmed, what with that movie's own confined spaces. And, well, Elevator did its job, as it got the ball rolling for Cube. And many see this movie as a prologue or even a precursor to Cube, and it's been released as a special feature in some Cube home media releases. And yes, the security guard in Elevated is played by David Hewlett, who would go on to play David Worth in Cube. It was even nominated for a Genie Award for Best Live Action Short Drama. Number 6. Filming Cube managed to get funding from the Canadian Film Centre, which is a charity organisation that helped young filmmakers with its film school and training programs. In fact, Cube was the organisation's first feature film. Cube was filmed in Toronto, and its shoot just lasted 20 days, and it was mainly shot just using a handheld camera. Despite its many different rooms seen in the movie, the set itself was just made up of one cube, and the room colours were just changed using gel panels. Because of this though, the film was not shot in sequence, but rather by colour code. For example, all the scenes involving red rooms were filmed together, as with the blue room scenes and so on. And according to IMDB, the digital special effects of Cube were provided by a company called Core, whom had also worked on the special effects for Blade and X-Men. And they provided the effects for free to show their support to the Toronto film industry. The special effects of Cube is one of the movie's strongest aspects. I can remember seeing it for the first time, and there were some scenes that generally really shocked me, like that guy at the start, I did not see that coming. Sadly though, the core digital effects company shut down in 2010. Number 5. The Cube was designed by a mathematician. The Cube's design and mathematical logic and functions came from the mind of a real mathematician, called David W. Provoca, who also acted as a mathematical consultant on Cube. I always felt that the design of the Cube always looked like some kind of giant puzzle. Like as if our characters are stuck in some high-tech crossword puzzle, or some kind of demented Rubik's Cube on acid. I don't know, I always felt the walls looked very puzzle-like. After all, the movie is essentially about solving puzzles, be that mathematical equations. But the cube also looked very high-tech too, like it could have been made by a secret government agency, or even extraterrestrial life. There was going to be six colours used for the cube rooms, six to represent the reoccurring theme of six within the cube movie itself. However, the movie's budget could only afford five gel panels. So, with that, I wonder what the missing cube colour would have been. I like to think that it would have been purple. Number four, sequels. Cube would go on to become a franchise with a string of sequels being released. So Cube 2, Hypercube, came out in 2002, and seems to have no involvement from Cube's creator, Vincenzo Natalie. And at this time, the movie was produced by big-time production company Lionsgate. And in the sequel, the story revolves around new characters that have been imprisoned. Cube 2, Hypercube, got mixed reviews, as on the one hand, its special effects and CGI was criticised, but on the other, critics appreciated how Cube 2 expands on the story and mythology that was introduced in the first Cube movie. 
Then in 2004, Cube Zero came out, which is described as being a prequel to the first movie. And once again, it revolves around new characters. And this time, Cube Zero was a straight-to-DVD release. But the reviews were even worse, with many fans claiming that the special effects look worse this time, as well as the acting. But regardless, the year 2004 marks the final chapter of a movie trilogy. And I think it suffice to say that the two sequels haven't become as celebrated as the first movie. Or as memorable for that matter, I mean I can barely remember them coming out. So, I guess that's the Cube Trilogy all wrapped up, with no more Cube Tales to tell, right? Well, not necessarily. Number 3. Remakes There is in fact a remake on the cards with Cube. All the way back in 2015, a remake was announced, which was to be called Cubed, which even had a script and producers and a director, with music video director Sam and Kesh on board the project for directing duties. And the movie was to be overseen by Lionsgate, whom seemed to own the Cube brand and oversaw its sequels. However, Cubed never came to be. Now this remake isn't scrapped entirely. Several pages, including Wikipedia, claim that its development is just on hold. So I don't know if that means there are some creative issues, or if the script needs rewrites, or heck, maybe even the current global situation has put things on pause. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see if we get this Cube remake. However, there already has been a Cube remake, a Japanese remake, also called Cube, which came out in 2021. This time round, this Cube installment got better reviews and a better reception than the previous two sequels. And yeah, from clips I've seen, this movie looks great. It has good cinematography, while also visually looking close to the 1997 original. But sadly, that's as much as I can say as I haven't seen the film entirely. But from what I have seen, it definitely has piqued my interest and I would totally be up for watching this. Number 2. Deleted Scenes so there are several deleted scenes that didn't make it into the final film, which is no shock, as every movie in the history of ever has had a few odd scenes here and there that have been vetoed. Two scenes in particular involve the characters finding an empty room that is a dead end, which I can understand this scene being removed. It doesn't really serve a purpose, nor add to the tension, but just sort of slows everything down, along with a scene where we see Kazam staring at his fingers. It's like it gives us an insight into the tinkering of his mind and how his brain functions. The most infamous of the deleted scenes was to show you the outside world that Kazan steps into at the end. There was a scene that was to reveal what was waiting outside the cube, according to IMDB anyway, and that that was the first scene to be removed during the editing process, and that it was Vincenzo Natalie himself who cut out these final moments. I can remember watching Cube for the first time and just aching to see what on earth was outside this damn cube. Is it the outside world or another cube or something else entirely? I initially didn't like the end as I felt that we had gone through so much and seen so many characters die for this moment and I kind of felt cheated. But as I've gotten older, I agree that the scene where we don't see what is waiting for Kazan is better, as it leaves you with more mystery and intrigue. And it's the kind of ending that just stands out in your mind and leaves your imagination trying to figure out the rest. Really, the movie Cube should never leave the cube, or it breaks the mysterious trance and illusion that it has on the viewers, and sometimes not knowing is better. For example, take the 2015 movie Circle. A movie which is so obviously influenced by Cube, in which strangers wake up in a mysterious high-tech prison setting, where they must vote every two minutes to decide who is going to be the next person to die via a beam. It's a reflection on human survival, but with a sort of reality TV game show mentality of voting out the next person and forming alliances, and etc. And like Cube, Circle has so much intrigue and mystery, which leaves you asking questions like why are they there? Who put them there? What is all this about? Who is behind this? But unlike Cube, Circle ends with the main protagonist escaping the high-tech prison where we see what is on the other side, where it becomes a generic alien invasion movie and loses the one thing that made that movie so special. It's mystery. Nope, give me the mysterious Cube ending any day. So in other words, if Cube took the movie outside the Cube, 
then the cube itself would no longer be special or have that threatening level of power and it would just become a generic whatever movie, whether it's aliens, government, or a sick individual. Number one, you want a cube? You've got a cube. Cube had its premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival in September 1997, and it would go on to make $9 million on a budget of a mere 350000 so it was very financially successful. It got mixed reviews. Some people liked its chilling atmosphere and setup, but felt that the payoff was lacking thanks to underdeveloped characters and an unsatisfying ending. I guess like my teenage self, they wanted to see what was outside the cube. But I think like my adult self, people have really come to appreciate Cube for what it is. And in time, it's become a cult movie, often making it to greater science fiction or horror movie lists. To me, the true horror of Cube is not so much the horrific booby traps, but it's tension that it builds. You can feel these characters are losing it in these scary, confined places, where they are put on the edge for survival, where their true selves come out. To me, the most scariest aspect of the movie is the Quentin character, played by Maurice Dean Witt, where we learn that he's actually a police officer. So you would think that out of everyone, he would be more adaptable to holding it together. And at the start, you actually believe that he is going to be the hero of the movie. But as the movie unravels, he becomes more and more aggressive and unstable, till it gets to the point where he goes full Jack Nicholson from The Shining and becomes a murderous madman. It's really honestly disturbing seeing this guy just lose it and lash out. It's the human reactions which to me is the true genius of Cube. It's the scenario of being put in a deadly situation where any wrong turn can result in a grisly death and the fight for survival our characters have to go through. A group of strangers who don't know each other nor do they know why they are there. It's not only a maze of the unknown, but a maze of the mind. And that's what makes Cube an unforgettable horror movie experience. So yeah, with that, I highly recommend Cube. It's a movie that's aged well, and it is still unnerving now as it was all the way back in 1997. So if you want a generally haunting psychological survival movie with a science fiction twist, check out Cube. Anyway, I'm Minty. And does anyone else agree that the Quentin character is the scariest part of Cube? Seriously, that guy was terrifying. See ya. He was terrifying. He was like really scary. Gave me nightmares and shit.